Well, thank you to Pastor Burzins for having me again. Uh, fill in for him is always filling in for Pastor Burzins is always an honor, of course. Uh, I have you here there at First Samuel chapter twenty-two. We're actually going to come back to that later. So if you'd like, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter ten because that's the first place I actually have uh, us look at in a, in a moment. So the title of this message is Christian privilege. Christian privilege, and some some of you may know what that might have to do with. Maybe you don't. But basically, the the whole goal of this sermon is going to be answering the 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 way of thinking uh, that some people have, which is that there's a such thing as white privilege, right? I don't believe in white privilege. I believe that there is a such thing as Christian privilege, and that's what this whole sermon is going to be about. And, you know, just as a disclaimer, because I realize this is a, 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 you know, a controversial subject for a lot of people. Hopefully it's not so controversial here. Uh, but you know what? The Bible says in Psalm 119, 165, it says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So, you know, it shouldn't really matter what I think. It should just matter to you what the Bible teaches and what the Bible says. So I'm going to be taking thing, you know, the Bible here, and I'm going to apply it as I see fit, and you can judge in your own mind if you agree with that or not. I think that it's pretty clear, but again, you can t- uh, have your own brain turned on tonight and think for yourself. You know, you might say, well, you know, you can't preach this because, you know, you're white. You know, you should have let Brother John preach this one. You know what I mean? Well, you know what? You know, he didn't pick this subject, so sorry, you know. So I, you're stuck with the white guy up here, you know, and I don't think it matters because the Bible says preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine unless you're white. No, it doesn't say that, right? And you know what? I'm not apologizing for being a white man today. A lot of people want to treat you like, oh, if you're white and you're a man, oh, man, that's, that's like a crime or something. Like You just need to apologize and have a shirt that says, I'm sorry for existing on your shirt. You know, I'm not going to wear that shirt. I don't feel that way. Hopefully you don't feel that way, okay? So, you know, I don't need to be a woman, you know, to preach on, you know, abortion, right? I don't need to be a veteran or a soldier to preach on, you know, uh, you know wars or whatever, right? Because I have the mind of Christ because I'm saved. I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, and we have the Bible here to tell us what's up with all this stuff, okay? So what is white privilege? You know, uh, white privilege is supposedly basically the idea that just if you are born white, then you just innately have just advantages and privileges that other people don't. Other people of color or black people don't have, uh, that they don't have. Uh, and does that exist? That's, you know, that's a question, right? Is there such thing as white privilege? And I'm going to answer, I'm going to ask that question in three different contexts. I'm going to ask it, well, does it exist like institutionalized or legally in America, right? And then I'm going to ask, does it exist just for individuals? And then I'm going to ask, does it, does it exist in the Bible? And we're going to look at that. Does white pri- privilege exist in America? Uh, or, or, or really, is it, is, is, does racism exist in America? Is legal racism happen in America? And the answer to that is no. Okay, you know, we don't have second-class citizens in America because, you know, the Jim Crow laws are no longer a thing. They were done away with in the 60s, okay? So, you know, I wasn't alive then. I've never, you know, I, you know lived during that time. Uh, so black people are not limited to, or, or white people are, or any type of, race or group of people or ethnic group they are not limited by you know anything like skin color in this country you you know you can literally have any office in this country no matter your skin color or no matter your gender either either right i mean we, we you have black police officers you have black judges you know ceos we had a black president for crying out loud i don't think we have legal racism in this country I mean, maybe you think, oh, that's crazy, but I think you're crazy if you don't just see what's just the obvious, okay? So institutionalized racism, I I don't buy it, okay? But you might say, well, yeah, but, you know, what about police brutality towards black people, right? That does exist. But you know, it also exists towards white people. It's just police brutality exists, right? So that's that's a thing. But, you know, a lot of times the police officers might just be doing their job, too, because some punk had some attitude 
whether white or black, and they just kind of bring it on themselves. Whether it's right or wrong, that's just kind of what happens. You know, sometimes you have, you'll have bad cops. I'm sure a lot of times you'll have bad cops that do things they shouldn't, right? But I don't think it's just this, oh, yeah, this secret club of cops that just they all hate black people, and they're just trying to figure out a way to just express that through their job. Well, what, well, what, how can they, what about all the black cops, though? That doesn't make any sense. Like, are they not included in that club? Or what about the black cop on white brutality? I mean, you just you don't hear about that, though, but that happens. So, you know, you know we're going to talk about a lot of things. So if you're already upset, you know, I don't know what to tell you. You probably should, just shouldn't have come. I mean, we put the title on the, on the TV for a reason, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, just hold on to your seat. Uh, so, you know, police brutality goes all ways. I have here, I'm just seeing where I'm at in my notes here. It's really just, you know, when it comes to this whole police brutality towards blacks, it's really just an, a biased, you know, uh, representation of what's happening. They're, you know, they're, they're only focusing on certain events because they're trying to push a certain narrative, right? They're not just, you know, just reporting the news unbiasedly. And just, we're, we're just showing all of the police brutality. No, you're not. Because you only want to focus on certain things. That's what's really going on. If you just look at the facts and you compare it to, how the media reports it. You know, shocker, the media is not always truthful, right? I mean, hopefully that doesn't shock everybody in here, but that's a, that's a thing, if you didn't know that, okay? What about individual, you know, racism? You know, what about individual, you know, you know individuals being racist and treating people differently based upon that? Does that exist? Of course that exists. I mean, but can you do anything about that? No, you can't, you can't legislate, you know, thought crimes and, and try to, you know, punish people for thinking something racist and then acting upon it, right? That's, that's always going to exist. And, you know, the thing about that is that's going to exist on both sides of the equation. And it's not just black and white. It's Latinos and other Latinos. It's, you know, Asian, ver uh, other Asians. It's just everyone in the world, no matter how similar they are or not, they're going to be racist towards each other because it's just sin. It's just a stupid way that people think. People that are ignorant, they don't even know or understand the fact that we all come from Adam and that we're all related. You know, and I'm going to get into some of that more later. But, yeah, of course that exists. And, you know, you could have people treat you better or worse based upon something like that that they believe in their heart. But if it's not legal for them to do that, what are you trying, like, what would you be trying to accomplish, you know, as far as what laws, you, what laws are you trying to get passed? If, that, if that's all that it is, because that's all I think it is. Okay, what about in the Bible? Is, is white privilege in the Bible? Is that, is that taught in the Bible? Is God a racist? The answer to that is no. You know, the, the God is not a racist. Okay, so I had you go to Acts chapter 10. Look at verse 34. God is not a racist. God doesn't care if you're white, black or something else as far as skin tone is concerned, right? The Bible says in Acts 10, 34, it says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. It don't really sound like God really cares what skin color you have because that's what every, you know, every nation, that's what that's talking about. It don't matter where you're from. It, he's, God's not a respecter of persons. He's not going to treat, you know, Brother Austin a certain way because of his skin color and treat, you know, Brother Michael here differently because of his skin color. He's not a respecter of persons. Okay? And that can apply to a lot of things, but tonight we're kind of focusing on this whole skin race subject because that's what everybody wants to be all sensitive about, it seems like, you know, in this, in this day and age. In our in our um, in our country here, turn to uh, Acts chapter seventeen. Every nation, it says, is accepted with him that worketh righteousness. Right, that's and that's kind of what we're going to be getting to ultimately uh, with this sermon when, when we're talking about Christian privilege. But we'll get more into that later. You're turning to uh, Acts chapter seventeen. I'm going to read Romans ten verse eleven. Says, for the Scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. It doesn't say 
black people or white people or Asian. It, it just says whosoever. That includes every skin tone right there. It's anybody. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, but it's just those two. No, no. it's any ethnic group. It's any race, right? There's no difference to God. He doesn't care. It's all the same, right? For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, the Bible says, 1 Timothy 4.10, that he's the Savior of all men, especially to the white man, though. Is that what that says? Is that what that verse says, especially to the white man, or especially to the black man, or especially to the Latino man? No, it just says he's especially to those that believe. And guess what? That's available to anybody. Anybody can decide whatever your skin tone is, whatever your shade is, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how you get accepted with God. And you know, I'm going to be using the term or the word races or race in this, in this sermon a lot. But don't get confused because you know what? There are no such things as races. There is, according to the Bible, one race. And, of course, the, the Bible doesn't use the word race in this context. But, you know, the Bible uses the word race in the context of running a race, right? The Bible uses the terminology, you know, nations, like we just read, and all nations are accepted of him, Right? That as long as you're doing righteousness or believing on him. But there's only one race. It's the human race. Okay? And because, you know, go ahead. I'll read in Acts 17, 24. It says, Acts 17, 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship. With men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Notice this. And hath made of one blood all nations. Not most nations. Not two bloods, because you got the white man and you got the black man. You know, or, or you know, you got him, uh, you know, Ham uh, and Shem, you know, or whatever. You know, it's like, no. It's one blood. We all come from Adam. And he married his rib. You know, he was really inbred, right? <laughs> we all come from Adam and Eve. And then we come from Noah. We're all related. Sorry to break it to you if you're just a white supremacist or if you just think you're like, like the black Hebrew Israelites. Like, oh, yeah, we're a real chosen, right? Because we're black. But you know what? That's vain. It's vain glory, okay? The Bible says in Galatians 5.26, let us not be desirous of vainglory. Don't desire vainglory, like what skin color you were just born with. You had no input in that decision. You didn't pick that unless you got a skin, you know, tan, like you went and got a tan somewhere, I guess, and that would be the only way. Or if you're like Michael Jackson, you're bleaching your skin. Well, you know what? Everyone that's normal, I'm not saying if you get a tan, you're not normal, but everyone that's normal, you know, you don't make a decision about that. I was just born white. I wasn't just like, yeah, I'm going to be white because that's the best, the white supremacy. Right? You know, you don't make that decision. And, you know, it doesn't matter. And, you know, if you think there's something so special about whatever the shade you are, that's vain glory. And you know what that does? It says, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another. Yeah, I'm, look at my skin. I'm better than you. It's like, that's so stupid. But, and, you know, you're doing, you're provoking other people. And then what else? Envying one another. Oh, yeah, these white people and they were white privilege. And then you're envying, right? And it, this, it just creates these unnecessary divisions. You know, I have no problem with division when it's, you know, over the things of God, right? But you know what? Dividing over, you know, your, your skin color is stupid. It's vainglory. And, you know, the Bible says, let him that glorieth glory in his skin color, right? Is that what it says? Let him that glorieth glory in the Lord. That's what you glory over, okay? And guess what? If you're treating someone with a certain shade better or worse because of that skin color, that's racism. You can't say, well, no, only, you know, if you treat someone badly, that's racism. No, if you treat a certain group of people better than everyone else because of their race, you know, that's racism. You know, I'm not up here, you know, worshiping the Jews today, and I'm not a Judeo-Christian or whatever, because I think that we're all equal. 
right? I think we're all of one blood. I'm not going to go around to, you know, to black people and say, hey, I'm sorry for being white. You know, you're so much better than me. Hey, here's some, uh, here, here's some of my money because I just owe it to you just because of the fact that you're black and I'm white. You know, I don't believe that. I think we're actually, I think we're actually all equal. I don't believe that we need to treat anyone better than someone else. Because you're just, at the end of the day, you're still basing it off of race, okay? And it shouldn't matter. You ought to have your mind be transformed by the, by the renewing of God's word and realize it's all one blood. God's not a respecter of persons, and neither should you, okay? But, and then, you know, you, but you got a lot of, you know, Christians, and maybe they're saved, maybe they're not, probably most of them are not. A lot of Christians that will try to use the Bible to justify racism, right? I've heard it. I mean, you know, I've heard it on both sides. You know, you got the white Christians will say, oh, you know, the mark of Cain, you know, that's where the black people came, that's where black people came from. It's like, the mark of Cain? That's where black, where does it say that in that story? Okay, how do you know that the mark then wasn't the white skin? How do you not know that everyone started out black and then the mark was the white skin? And you know what? How about the fact that a mark is not really an entire coat of something that's covering everything? If I, if I mark this wall black, does that mean I, I coat the whole thing black now and now the whole thing's black? No, I mean, it's probably like one spot. I mean, who knows what the mark of Cain was, right? You know, it could have been a tattoo for all we know. It could have been a you know, birthmark or a burn. It could have been an L on his forehead because he was a loser, right? Mur- you know, who knows what the mark was, right? But just to just, oh, no, it's black. He's, that's where black people came from because I'm racist, and that's just what I want to think. That's really what it is. You have your pre-racist conceived idea that you just want to insert in the Bible, but you know what? The Bible doesn't teach it. Sorry. Well, and then the black, uh, you know, the black people say, well, you know, you know, the white lepers, that's because we were all, they were all, all God's people were black. And then whenever someone got leprosy, you know, they were white because that was the punishment. You're like, yeah, I've heard that. I don't know if you ever heard that before. And it's just so stupid. It's like, well, who comes up with this? It's like, you, you got to want to, you know, just insert that to, to believe that. Well, you know, Jesus was black because his hair was like wool. I've heard this a bunch of times, too. It's like, that's so stupid. And where it says that, it's talking about how it's white like wool. You know, it talks about his hair is white like wool. His face is like the sun. His eyes are like lamps of fire. It's like, it's talking about his glorified body. Because he was probably Middle Eastern in the first place, but that's beside the point because it doesn't matter. But when it's talking about his hair being white, you know, being like wool, it's not because people, I've heard black people say, well, you know, Jesus' hair was like wool. And that's talking about because, you know, black people have, you know, most, a lot of times have curlier hair. It's real bushy or whatever. And that's like wool. Wool, you know, fleece or whatever. But you know what? That's just, have you ever seen a wool's fleece or a a sheep's wool? It's like, that's not really even what it looks like, in my opinion. I was looking at it, too. I was Googling it. I mean, you could, whatever. I mean, that's just such a far cry. I, I mean, whatever. That's your big argument. Bravo. He was black for sure. Who cares? But it literally says it's white like, well, that was the whole point. But what, you hear these arguments, you know, you know, and then and here's a better argument where, like, the Old Testament will say, have different characters say, like, hey, I'm black because of this or I'm black because of that. I don't know if you, if you know what I'm talking about. I'm not really trying to get into all this. I know I'm throwing these things out there. But if you just look up the word black in the Bible, it's always in the context of someone being, like, famished because they haven't eaten or, or, you know, like they're just really depressed. It's a hyperbole. It's, it's an exaggeration. It's not like, oh, yeah, the whole nation of Israel, they're all just black people. That's, that's what he's saying. Again, you have to want to think that if that's, if that's where you come out of thinking. And sometimes it doesn't make sense if that's what you're thinking, because it talks about, like, becoming black. It's not talking about the skin color there. It's not talking about a black person there. It's like, yeah, because they're all white. That's why. He's like, no. <laughs> because the descendants of Ham, right? Yeah. No. That's stupid, because you're just making up stuff, okay? So you can't get racism out of the Bible here, okay? You know, i tell you where you can get racism from, though. You can get it from evolution, because you know, the book that you know evolution is heavily based upon, the origin of the species. Well, the full title. A lot of people know this, but the full title of that book is this: "On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life." 
So favored, right? Well, which ones are favored? So now you just, everybody's opinion is just going to be, uh, you know, whoever's, whoever has the opinion, oh, well, this is the superior race, or no, this one is, and everyone always picks the wrong, it seems like, you know? But that's, that's evolution. And guess what evolution is? A lie. It doesn't even make any sense, you know? Things didn't just happen on their own, you know? It's like Brother John, uh, Brother John Carter was preaching on this morning. The, the world itself shows us that things didn't just happen on their own. If I was walking out into, you know, uh, some kind of nature walk or something, and I just see, like, a bunch of rocks stacked up on each other, I wouldn't be like, oh, wow, that just happened all by itself. What are the chances of that, huh? No, I would, be like, I would obviously know, no, this is very complex. This doesn't just happen by itself because there's a law of things going into decay and things deteriorating over time, not things just magically stacking. You know, it's not Mary Poppins over here, just things stacking up by themselves. This is how it works at my house. That's why my house is so clean. Is you just snap your fingers and everything just gets you know un, you know folded up and put in place. That's not how. I, obviously, someone did that. Someone stacked those rocks. Because thing complicated things don't just happen on their own. And life is very complicated. That's why evolution is stupid. You know what else teaches ra- racism? I have here the Book of Moron, <laughs> that I like to call it, the Book of Mormon. Because you know Mor- the Book of Mormon teaches racism. And this isn't a sermon against the book of, uh, against Mormonism, but, you know, it kind of is in a little bit, too, because I'm going to be reading a little bit of what they got to say about skin color here, just in case you never heard it before. In, you know, Second Nephi, all, everyone open up your, you know, books of Moron. The Second Nephi 5.21, and he had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against them that they had become like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. So they were wicked, is what it's saying. And then because they were wicked, God cursed them. And they used to be white and they used to be, you know, delightsome, right? But now they're black, so, you know, that's where black people came from. It's the mark of Cain, right? But this is the book of Moron. This is not the Bible. Sorry, this is not the Bible, in case you weren't paying attention. This is the book of Mormon, okay? This book teaches that you have to repent of your sins. That's where that phrase comes from, by the way, repent of your sins. You know, you don't have to repent of your sins to be saved, but, you know, that phrase is not actually in the Bible, but it is in the book of Moron. In Jacob, in the, you know, the book of Jacob, Two, or uh, it's actually three, it says in verse 8 here, O oh my brethren, I fear that unless ye shall repent of your sins, that's that phrase, that their skins will be whiter than yours when ye shall be brought with them before the throne of God. So, you know, you got to repent of your sins or you're not going to be, you know, you're not going to be, you're not going to be white. If you don't repent of your sins, you're going to be black, and that's a punishment. Doesn't that, make, doesn't that make sense that just being black is a punishment? No. Like, how is that a punishment? So that's, it's, that's the, again, that's the book of uh, Moron, okay? <coughs> Trash here. So, you know, what? I don't believe the book of Moron. I don't believe, you know, evolution. So I believe the Bible. You know, you can't find racism in the Bible. Go ahead and turn to, did I, did I have you turn to Exodus 12? Go ahead and turn to Exodus 21. Well, where did blacks come from then? I've heard, I've had someone ask me that. Like, I'll say, no, it's not Ham. It's not, it's not Cain. It's like, they'll say, well, where did they come from? It's like, where did white people come from? Where did anybody come from, you idiot? We come from Adam and Eve. It's like, what? It's like, well, well, where did they come from? How come we're not all the same color? It's like, it's genetics, dude. We all come from Adam and Eve, and black and white is just a different genetic trait you could have. And depending on where you live in the world, it'll come out. Because if you're closer, to, if you're living close to the equator, you're going to have darker skin because that genetic trait thrives there. If you're closer to the poles, sorry, we're not flat earthers here, then you're going to be lighter, right? And you're in the Middle East, you're kind of in the middle, right? And that's why they're like in between. They're like that brown. Mystery solved. Now you can stop being a racist because you understand a little bit of science. And I'm not even that great of a scientist. I'm just, this is pretty basic, right? Where'd they come from then? There you go. There's your answer. 
Stupid. Okay, so in the Old Testament, God's not a racist. We had the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. But you know what? Any foreigner, anytime they wanted to, guess what they could do? They could join the nation of Israel. Because God's not a racist. Because there's no such thing as white privilege in the Bible. Okay? You're, at, you're in Exodus 21. I'm going to read from you in Exodus uh, 12. If you want to flip back, you can. You're, you're really close to it. Exodus 12, verse 48 says, And when a stranger, that word stranger there is referring to a foreigner, okay, shall sojourn with thee and will, and will keep the Passover. So he wants to keep the Passover. He wants to serve the Lord. He wants to, to do that. Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So in verse, tw- uh, verse 49 it says, One law, not two laws, one law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto him the stranger that sojourneth among you. One law. You don't have a one set of laws for this group of people and another set of laws for this group. You know, we got the, we got the white man's water fountain. And we got the black man's water fountain. It's like, no, it's just one law. It's just one water fountain. Actually, I don't want to drink out of water fountain. I want to drink out of my little cup. So, you know, there's one law. And all you had to do to join the nation of Israel is get circumcised. In the Old Testament, it was get circumcised and observe the Passover. All you have to do is turn from your false gods. All you have to do is acknowledge the Lord as the true God, and you can join. That's pretty simple. Anyone could do that. You're in, uh, you're in Exodus 21 still. Same thing in, uh, whenever they came back from captivity. In Ezekiel 47, verse 22, it says, And it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you and to the strangers that sojourn among you. To the strangers again. They're going to divide the lot, the land, to the strangers, which shall beget children among you. And they, who? The strangers, the foreigners, the people that are not, you know, the same skin color perhaps, right? They shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. And they shall have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. Yeah, but what tribe are they going to be then? All right, you hear, you hear these questions. Verse 23, And it shall come to pass that in what tribe the stranger sojourneth, there shall ye give him his inheritance, saith the Lord God. So anyone can join. All you got to do, worship the Lord. You don't have to get a tan. You don't have to bleach your skin. That wasn't a part of the conditions there. Right? I didn't read it. Did I miss it? I know I'm reading the King James tonight. Is it in the NIV? I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> so, well, what about how they weren't supposed to marry foreigners in the Old Testament? Huh? What about that? Because God liked white people better or, or, or whatever, black people better. It's like the whole point of not marrying foreigners is because you're not supposed to marry unbelievers. And that's not just the Old Testament either. That's New Testament too. Because you're not supposed to be unequally yoked with unbelievers in, in any situation, but especially your marriage. Because look at Ruth and Boaz. Ruth was a Moabite, okay? And then she was worshiping the Lord. She didn't have to get circumcised. She could skip that part. And then she went straight to, uh, she, she joined herself to the nation of Israel. And she was marrying Boaz, and that marriage was blessed. Because guess who came about because of that marriage? David, right? Uh, you know, as the, one of, you know, the, the, the grandson. Or the great-grandson, I think. I'm not sure. Anyway, what, you know what I'm talking about, though. Yeah, okay, well, maybe the Bible doesn't teach, uh, you know, racism, but it does teach slavery, and that's the same thing. The Bible teaches slavery. And I and one time I was out soul winning with uh, Brother Lindsey here, and I shouldn't have probably talked to this guy as long as I did. He was a black guy, and I was, you know, trying to give him the gospel. You know, it wasn't a really receptive place, so I was just kind of like entertaining the conversation more than I should have. And he was getting all hot and bothered about just really hating the Bible. And he was looking at me, I got my Bible, and he's like, and he was talking about how Americans in the past, you know, they were using that book, you know, to justify slavery. And I'm like, you know what? People can use this book to justify all kinds of stuff, but that don't mean that book necessarily teaches that. I mean, as I just really demonstrated with the whole thing that people, all those passages are places that people will try to twist to teach racism 
in the Bible, but those are all twisted. And you can stand behind the Bible, but it doesn't mean that the Bible actually teaches that verse. Okay, what does the Bible teach about slavery? Does the Bible condone American slavery? No. I don't believe so. I think the answer to that is a no. Because this is, you were in, I had you turn to Exodus 21, right? Look at verse 16. Okay? It says, And he that stealeth a man, kidnapping, right? And selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall be a slave owner, and everything's good, everything's great, and that's what we're all about here. And no, he said he shall surely be put to death. Well, that's that, that's exactly what was going on in America, right? You got, and it wasn't just America. You know, the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade. You got Africans betraying and selling other Africans. By the way, it wasn't just white people that were involved in that. You just know history. Other Africans were were kidnapped their own, sell them. And then other nations would partake in that wickedness, and America was one of them. But, you know, the Bible teaches that when you're kidnapping people, that you're worthy of death. And that's what was going on in America. And it don't really sound like the Bible's condoning it, does it, to me? Not to me. Yeah, but there's other places that does teach, like, slavery. Well, you know what? The Bible teaches what to do when someone steals from you and how that they should pay that back if they have nothing to pay. And how there's a limited time of six years that they're supposed to pay that off. Yeah. But, it, it, but that's not even necessarily someone of a different ethnicity. That's just, a, it could be another white guy. So, you know, racism and, and uh, slavery don't necessarily have to go hand in hand, first of all. But, you know, what? that to me actually makes sense. If someone steals from me, well, what happens? They should just pay the government some fine. What about me? I'm not getting any justice. You know, the Bible makes sense. The law of the Lord is perfect and actually makes sense and resonates with my conscience, okay, because it just makes sense. And that's why the Bible teaches, hey, you know, if you're caught stealing, if you're breaking up stealing, you know what? You're supposed to pay that person, you know, either twice the amount, four times, five times, you know, fivefold, whatever, right? But you know what? If they don't have any money, oh, well, I guess we just let it go. No. Now you're going to work it and pay it off. But guess what? There's a limit, though. It can't be any more than six years, right? So it's not like just this lifelong slave. And you know what? And there's other types of situations where, you know, God specifically told the nation of Israel to conquer a certain land or to wipe out and destroy certain, you know, just wicked places apart in, in the world and to destroy them all or what to, you know, or what to do when uh, someone would attack them. And God did not necessarily instruct for those specific people to just all be wiped out, but they could actually make them bond servants. Or you want to call it slaves. The Bible doesn't use the word slave there. But you know what? What do you, what do, you do with prisoners of war when the whole nation is taken over? Right? It's in a righteous war. Not like, oh, we're going to invade some country because they're betraying each other and selling them into slavery, and we're just going to cash in on that action. No, you're actually like self-defense defending yourself, and God's like, yeah, you don't have to wipe everyone out. You don't have to kill everyone. Then what do you do with them? Well, God instructed that, and I think that makes sense. Well, you're just, oh, I don't like that. that did, well, you know what? You can just shove it because the Bible is right and you're wrong. Yeah. Now, I think it makes sense, and it's not even the same thing that was going on in America. Completely different types of situations. Hopefully, you can understand that. And you know, You know, I talked about how Africans were kidnapping their own. You know, the Bible says, now, this, uh, where, where, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, or there is freedom, right? And you know what? Africa was a wicked place. And you know what? They're just in sin, going around half-naked, smoking drugs, worshiping Satan. And you know, God is not just the God of the white man. He's the God of the whole earth. And he's not just, okay, oh, you know, they're just worshiping their God. That's okay. God's not thinking that. He expects everyone to worship him. And when there's a part, of play, uh, part in the world where they're not worshiping him and they're just worshiping whatever de uh, devil, he's going to do something about it. And, you know, it's not just black people. He's done it all throughout the Bible. Read the book of Judges, my friend. The nation of Israel, you know, the chosen, whatever color you think they were, they're constantly going into captivity as a punishment from God. 
Why? He's just looking for entertainment or something, and that's why he's letting it happen? No, because of their sin. And you just see this pattern, this roller coaster type pattern in, in the book of Judges and all throughout you know, the kings and just the, the history of the nation of Israel. And it wasn't just the nation of Israel. It's the other surrounding nations because he's, he's not a respecter of persons. If you're wicked and you're not serving the Lord, you're going to have you know, someone invade your land. You're going to have pestilence. You're going to have famine or captivity. None of that's any fun. All of it's a punishment from God. God's not just letting random nations go into slavery for no reason. I don't believe that. I believe that God so loved the world, and if he's going to allow something like that to happen to a nation, it's for a greater good because he's trying to get them to be humble, to turn away from their satanic false god so that hopefully they could maybe get the gospel, okay, and turn to him and worship the Lord. And that's what you see in the book of Judges. You'll see in the book of Judges, They'll, they'll have this, you know, prosperous time where they're all worshiping the Lord and then everything's great and then they get, you know, spoiled and they get all, you know, comfortable and they start dabbling in sin and they start getting more and more wicked and then they are just completely forsaking the things of God and then God has to bring down the hammer and judge them and they're, you know, brought, brought into some captivity, captivity of the Philistines or captivity of the Moabites or the Amalekites or whoever it is and then they are humbled. Because of their lowly condition, because they're in captivity, they're in bondage. Oh, God, save us, right? And then they repent, they get right with God, and then he raises a deliverer, he raises a judge, right? And then they're, they're brought back into prosperity. They'll have peace again, and then they go through that cycle all over again. And it's happening, and it's been happening ever since the beginning of time, and it's going to continue to happen. And God uses, throughout the Bible, other nations to judge other nations, Right? In the, na- in the nation of Israel, or, or specifically the nation of Judah at the time, God allowed King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, which was a more wicked nation than the nation of Judah at the time. And, you know, but he, he still used him to take them and, and, allow, and have them in that 70-year captivity, okay, as a punishment. And it was, you know, so God used that nation to do that, but it wasn't right for that nation to do that. And you know what happened to Babylon? They got judged too for what they did to the nation of Judah. And you know what? Same thing with America. Same thing with Africa. You know, you got a bunch of wicked things going on in Africa. Sin abounds. Well, you know what? It doesn't surprise me when people are portraying their own and selling them into slavery. And you know what? America partakes in that. And as we become more and more wicked in general anyways, God someday is going to judge America including for the sins in the, of the past, partaking in this men stealing. And, you know, and we might, that might happen by some other nation, or it could be God himself doing it, and eventually that's how it's all going to be settled. God's going fi- to have that final settling of the score when he steps in and he judges the whole world and sets up his kingdom that will reign forever and ever. And you know what? Uh, let's see where I'm at in my notes here. I'm hitting all this stuff, and I wasn't even looking. Good for me. (laughs) Got to make sure I don't get too carried away. I want to follow these notes here. So, you know, so even though God might allow something like that to happen to Africans, you know, there's probably a lot of innocent bystanders, too, people that were just born there. They weren't necessarily, I mean, there's only so much you could do if you're like a little kid being sold into slavery, right? But, you know, Man might mean that for evil, but God will mean it for good. That's what happened to Joseph. He was sold into slavery. He didn't do anything to deserve it, right? He was just uh, basically uh, a victim in that situation, right? But, you know, it was actually for a greater good, though, because just like he told his brethren, you know what? You betrayed me. You sold me into slavery. Joseph told his brethren, you meant it for evil, but you know what? God meant it for good to save much people alive. And you know what? I'm sure there's a lot of Africans that were brought over into slavery, which wasn't right, but they got the gospel when they got here. And you know what? I bet you there's a lot of Africans that if they hadn't have been brought over, not saying it was right, don't misunderstand, not justifying the the slavery in the situation. But but God, I still believe, used it. And now I'm sure there's a lot of Africans that got the gospel, and they're in heaven right now because they got the gospel. You know, what would be better? for them to have lived their entire life in Africa free, doing their voodoo or whatever, and then dying and going to hell, right? 
or what happens? And then they go to heaven. They get the opportunity. Now, again, it doesn't justify it. The ends do not justify the means, but this is how God works. This is what God does in the Bible. And America is going to be judged for this. Right. And, you know, so hopefully that all makes sense and you understand this and you're not, you know, getting your panties all in a water right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it, the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You know what? What about the man in the jungle? Well, you know what? God's going to figure out a way to reach him. If he's if he's seeking the truth. I mean, it's, it's it happened in this scenario I'm describing. Right. But, you know, uh, go, so going back, so there, there is no white privilege institutionalized in this country. There is, um, you know, racism that exists in just individuals' hearts acting outside of the law. Sure, I'll give you that. But that happens both ways, okay? But I is there racism taught in the Bible? No. The Bible does teach a form of slavery, but it's not the same thing that you're thinking of that you demonize so much. The Bible's type of slavery actually makes sense. You know, you can take that up with God. I think it makes sense, though. And, you know, again, then you could do a whole sermon on a lot of these things. And I know Pastor Bergen has done a full-length sermon on slavery in the past where he went through and explained this in much more detail. If you want to check that out, if you were not convinced. But what about just privilege in itself? Does privilege exist? You know, forget about the white part, okay? Well, just Does privilege exist? Do people just treat you better or worse in general? Of course, and because, you know, there's all different types of, you know, opinions that people have or reasons why people would treat you differently. Because guess what? We're not all the same. We're all different. And, you know, people will treat you differently based upon that. I'm not saying it's right, right or wrong, but this is just a fact of life. And, you know, we're not all born in the same situation. We're all born with different advantages, and we're all born into different disadvantages. You know, some people are born into, uh, you know, a poorer or a richer, you know, family or part of the world. Thank God we all are born in America. You know, pro most people are probably born in America. I don't know every single person. But we're all in America now, and there's a lot of blessings just associated with that alone, just where you were born, okay? You know, you could have been born in some other part of the world that just didn't have a lot of advantages there. You know, you could have been born pretty. You could have been born ugly, you know, short, tall, you know, smart, dumb, athletic, strong, weak, you know, male, female. Not that one of those is worse or better than the other. You could have been born handicapped, disabled. I mean, there's all kinds of things you could have that you were just born into that you didn't do anything to cause, but it's just your life, okay? There's all kinds of different privileges, and there's all, you know, people could treat you differently based upon all kinds of, all, all, all those things. You know, you could get the pretty privilege. If you're a young lady, if you're, a, if you're a young woman, you might get pretty privilege, or people just are nice to you, and they just treat you nice just because you're pretty. And then when you get older and you're an old woman and you're like, why is everyone so mean, you know? Well, maybe it's because you're older. You're not so pretty anymore. And you were just living in, you know, a fantasy this whole time. You didn't know it. You know, there, or what, people will treat you differently. I'm not saying it's right that they do that. This is just life, though. We're not supposed to be a respecter of persons for these things. But that, that's what happens. But that is what the world will do. Okay? But you know what? None of that stuff matters compared to Christian privilege. Because, you know, you might have been born with different advantages or disadvantages, but you know what? The most important advantage you could get, and you can get this for yourself, is Christian privilege. The, that advantage, that benefit. Okay? Go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. You know, what is Christian privilege? How about just the fact that you were raised in a Christian home? Now, you couldn't, you couldn't have controlled that, but you know what? If you were born in a Christian home... That is a privilege. That is an advantage. Getting the gospel from a child, that is a privilege. That is an advantage. Getting saved at an early age. I mean, even if your, your family wasn't even necessarily saved, but you were still raised with, you know, some type of Christianity and you had God's laws in your house to some degree, that in of itself is still a blessing. Because, you know, Christian privilege is kind of a two-part. You, you're going to get a privilege if you're just saved, right? You're going to get the chastening of God, though, if you're not living righteous. That's the other element. You have to live right. You have to apply God's laws to your life. Now, you could be unsaved, and because you have God's law in your heart, your conscience, like Brother John Carter preached this morning, you know, you're just doing certain things 
you know, instinctually, right, you're going to have certain blessings just for that. You know, but that's going to be limited, of course, because you're not saved. But I'm just, there's just certain things that are built in. If you keep God's laws, there's going to be certain blessings built into that. If you're, an uns- you know, if you're unsaved and you're going out, you know, as a whoremonger, you know, you're, you're probably going to get STDs. That's not a Christian privilege. That's a, that's a disadvantage, right? But if you keep the God's law and you're like, no, I'm going to be pure, I'm going to have the one life, well, you know, you're going to get the benefit and the privilege of all the blessings that come from that. But, you know, you want the whole package. You want the full Christian privilege of, hey, you're saved and you're keeping God's law. That's really what you want. And I believe that most people in here are saved. So, you know, keeping God's laws, is the, that's the real challenge, right? And that's up to us. That's the struggle every day. You know, we're warring against the flesh every day, the flesh and the spirit. <clears throat> so Deuteronomy chapter 7 says in verse 11, Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes the ju- and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Wherefore, it shall come to pass if ye hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thy fathers, and he will love thee and bless thee. That's the privilege. That's the blessing. That's what you want. That's the you know, special treatment. But you know what? Anybody can get it. It's not God being a respecter of persons because there's a condition you have to meet. See that if, right? You got to hearken to these judgments. You got to keep and do them. You can't just be a hero of the word. You got to be a doer too. Oh, yeah, I heard all the preaching, so I'm good. No, you got to hear and do it. You got to have the application there too. And then if you do that, you will be blessed unless you're white. Sorry. Unless you're black, sorry, it won't work for you because you're not the right skin tone. Sorry, that verse doesn't exist. That line isn't in there. It's for everybody. Are you sure it's for everybody? Yes. I'm going to read you a verse that proves that, actually. If you're in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Look uh, forward in Deuteronomy chapter 29. It's not just certain skin tones that can get this privilege this christian privilege it's open for anyone and everyone the bible says in deuteronomy 29 look at verse 9 keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them that ye may prosper in all that ye do skip down to verse 14 neither will i only uh, neither with you only do i make this covenant and this oath not just making this promise to you the people that he's talking to the nation of israel at the time verse 15 but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. That's everybody else. So if you weren't there, it's okay. I wasn't there either. But it still applies. You know why? Because it just says, hey, if you weren't here, you can still keep it. You can still get the blessing. You can still get the privilege. You just got to meet the condition. That's how you get the Christian privilege. Okay, so I'm going to look at a couple of facts here uh, that I brought up. You know, we don't have a we don't have a, a sin problem, uh, a, a skin problem. We have a sin problem. So we do not have a skin problem. We have a sin problem. I'm going to read you a couple of facts and some statistics here about the black versus white community population in America. It says that that according to census.gov, 13 approximately percent of the population are made of black people, 75 percent white. So 13 percent black, 75 percent white. I didn't even know that. That's interesting. So 13 percent of the population black, 75 percent white. Remember that. According to fathers.com, 57, a little bit over 57 percent of black children don't live with their dad. Because of white privilege, right? And it's, and then 31% of whites don't live with theirs. That's, that's interesting. Is that because of white privilege? I think it's because of the lack of Christian privilege. I think it's because of the lack of a dad willing to stay home and man up to his responsibility. I don't think it has anything to do with sin, uh, uh, skin color. I think it's a sin problem, not a skin problem. And it does, But it doesn't have to be that way. 
It doesn't have to be that way. It's a choice. I could have been, I mean, I could have been born, you know, where it's where the white people are the majority. But it's it's an individual choice. Homicides in 2019, white victims, 3,299. So that's how many uh, white people were killed or, or, or murdered in 2019. And 2,594 of those were other white people. So the majority of people, um, the majority of white people that are getting killed are being killed by other white people. Black offenders was 577. So only a very much smaller number, only 566 uh, black offenders were actually the ones killing the white victims in that situation. Black victims, 2,906. Which again, when you think about the fact that they're only 13% of the population, but they still have like a very similar number to the whites. That's kind of interesting. So a lot of a lot more black people are being killed. Oh, that's because of white privilege. See? They're privileged. That's why they're not being killed. But you know what's interesting about this? The white offenders, 246. That's actually le- there's actually less white people killing black people in America than there are black people killing white people. You say that, you know, ten times fast. Well, you know, and but black offenders uh, killing other b- the black victims, 2,574. So just like the majority of uh, uh, the white offenders on white uh, victims. It's the same thing with uh, black on black. So it, for some reason, racism is not really coming into play when you're looking at the homicides. So it doesn't really seem like it's uh, a white privilege there. When you look at the facts, it doesn't really look like it's a thing. It seems like it's just a sin problem, not a skin problem, if you ask me. Okay? Uh, the percentage of black inmates in America, according to BOP.gov, is 38.5%. Again, they're 13% of the population, but they're making up almost 40% of the inmates. White inmates were more, 57. But uh, remember, the popula- the percentage of white population was 75%, but they're only making up 57% of the inmates in America. So there, there's some distortion here. So you're like way more likely, just statistically speaking, if you're black, to be an inmate, right? You know, b- you know black women getting abortions. Uh, they make up 38.4, almost 40% of the abortions are being done by black women, you know, with their, with their children. White women are 33%. So w- that's, that's crazy because they're only 13% of the population, but they're getting almost 40% of the abortions. That's crazy. Is that, is that because of white privilege? I think it's because of a sin problem, not a skin problem. Because it's a personal choice that you you have to make, right? So I just thought that'd be so. You know, don't call me racist when I'm just looking at the facts here, right? And and you, and I'm gonna get into that. You don't want to get too ahead. Uh, so the way to God's blessing is through the door of obedience, no matter the skin color. I got some extra verses here. I'm gonna read this one. It says in Psalm 1-1, famous verse, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And you know what? It goes hand in hand with uh, with this verse. You know, I think about on this subject, when you think about what's causing this, this difference in sin in the black culture, because it's this rap hip hop culture, right? Because you got this rap hip hop that's glorifying sin, it's glorifying drugs, it's glorifying you know fornication, it's glorifying you know just pride, and I'm the best rapper, or I'm the best at this, I'm the best at that, and I, I'm literally just songs all about committing crimes. And there's there's different rap songs about different things, and I'm not saying that other genres are not wicked either, but I see this as just a, a big influencer, right? You know, reject the hip hop indoctrination. Reject this sin indoctrination. Don't be a criminal. You don't have to be. You know, if you're if you're born in a disadvantaged situation, you can still choose to serve God. You don't have to be a drug addict. You don't have to be a gangbanger or, or, or getting someone knocked up or, or you don't have to get an abortion. You can be a man that mans up and stays there for your child. You have the choice. 
It's the personal responsibility is what we're talking about. Personal responsibility. You have the choice. Do not have this victim attitude. Like, I'm a victim, and I was born with these disadvantages, so now I'm just going to justify all this sin or whatever because I was born a victim or I was victimized. You know, I'm, I'm not privileged. I'm not white, so I'm going to, I just got a carte blanche, an excuse to do whatever crime. You know what? Everyone could have a victim attitude. No matter who you are, no matter how rich or how spoiled, you know, anyone could just have this, oh, I don't want his shoes, or oh, I'm not as pretty as she is, or oh, I wish I was as popular as so-and-so. Or You could just pick something. The grass is always green on the other side, right? Don't be a victim in your own mind, because you know what? That's going to help nothing. It's not going to help you. It's going to make everything worse, Okay. And, you know, quit comparing yourself. You know, if you, the Bible teaches if you compare yourselves among yourselves, you're not wise. Stop worrying about what brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so has or what someone else has going for them or what, you know, you were born or, 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 or maybe a condition you have. Don't compare yourself among yourself. Be content with your situation. If you can't control it, be content. Now, if it's something you can't control, do what's right. It's that simple. Being this victim and just envying others is not going to help. Don't envy others. The Bible says in Romans 13, verse 13, you can go ahead and turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 22, that's where we started. We're, fine, we're, we're coming back to it, don't forget. In Romans 13, 13, it says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. We're not supposed to walk envying and just... Oh, I wish I was like, you know, it must be nice being whatever or having that. Must be nice not having to drive four hours to church, right? But, you know, whatever, pick, pick it. You can pick anything. Must be nice being tall, Brian. Must be nice getting to dunk a basketball, you know, or whatever. Must be nice getting to grow a full beard, Lindsay, you know, whatever. Pick something. You could, we're all different, so you could pick anything. It's stupid. Don't envy. Be content. That's what the Bible says, actually. I'm going to read it for you in case you didn't believe that. In Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's why you can be content, because you got God that loves you. He died on the cross for you. And you can get Christian privilege. You can get him on your side. Anyone can. A sound heart, the Bible says, is the life of the flesh, but envy, the rottenness of the bones. If you envy and you're a victim in your own mind, you're only hurting yourself. You're killing yourself. It's the rottenness of the bones. It's not helping. It's not helping at all. You know, you say, well, I wasn't born with Christian privilege. I wasn't born in a Christian home. I, I didn't get saved until later in life. Well, you know, praise God you got saved later in life. And you know what? You get the opportunity to make sure your children, if you're able to have children, Get to be raised in a Christian home. You can make sure that that goodly heritage gets passed on and bestowed upon them. And you can make a change. Or you could just be a victim and say, well, I wasn't born, so I'm just going to live like the devil. And then that's going to help a lot, I'm sure. That's going to bless your children, I'm sure. I don't think so. See, I'm trying to empower the person who maybe thought they were a victim to get over it and to do something about it. You're the only one that can do something about it, right? And here's the thing. A lot of times when people have this victim attitude, they're not even a victim. Like, they, know, they weren't even done wrong. Like, and we got different, we have black people in here. I don't think any of you guys were ever slaves. I, you know, I was never a slave. It's like, oh, you know, white, white privilege. You were never a slave. You were never living during the time you know, unless you're very old, like 60 or 70 maybe or 80 years old, you're never even living during a time where segregation was a thing in this country. I mean, what are you crying about? Nothing even happened to you. You're just making up stuff. You can't look at the, you know, the facts that I was reading and just attribute that to some kind of white privilege. It does, it's not real. Get over it. Quit having all the excuses. Why don't you take some responsibility for your choices, be content with whatever situation you were born into, and make the most of it.
God's not limited to your situation. He can do above, uh, you know, what we ask or think. You know, so I, I wanted us to read that story. You know, that's why I picked that, that chapter about uh, Saul. Because we're going we're gonna to talk about Saul. We're going to talk about somebody who was a victim in their own mind. Saul was. And we're going to see what happened to him, see what, he, see what his attitude was. 1 Samuel 22, verse 6 says, When Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men that were with him, now Saul bowed in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Here now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me? And there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you that is sorry for me, or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servants against me, to lie in wait as at this day. Poor pitiful you, Saul. It's all your fault. Like, he's talking to his soldiers that are there, that are like on his side. It's your fault. What? Like, yeah, we're here. We're your, we're your soldiers. And it's like, what's he talking about? Like, do I got the wrong uniform on or something? Or what? You know, I don't know if they wore uniforms. It's, just, it's like, we're on your side, Saul. Like, that's why we're here, you know? Whatever. And it's like, it's your fault. You didn't show me. It's, you know, no one's sorry for me. Why don't you feel sorry for me? Look at me, you know. <laughs> Can't you tell there's something, you know. Look at my face right now. You know, it's all my son's fault. You know, he stirred up David. It's his. That didn't even happen. Did Jonathan stir up David against Saul? It, what? No, that didn't happen. Saul disobeyed God, actually. If you read in 1 Samuel 13, Saul's the one who disobeyed God and did the sacrifice that he wasn't supposed to do. He took upon himself. That's where this curse came from. That's why he's not right with God. He's the one that didn't destroy all the Amalekites like he was supposed to. He's the one. But he doesn't want to take responsibility for what he's done. He just wants to blame everyone else. It's all your fault. How come you don't feel sorry for me? Why don't you just get right with God, Saul? Why don't instead of blaming everybody for something that didn't even happen to you, but it's actually your own fault, why don't you just get right with God instead? That's what Saul should have done. He wouldn't have been king anymore, but he could have still gotten right with God and still lived a better life. But instead, he went on to, to commit even worse sins. And you know what? He felt sorry for himself. You know what happens next in verse uh, 9? Then answered Doeg the Edomite. And if you know the Bible, this dude's a reprobate because he's this person who just loves blood, right? He just looks at all these priests, like, yeah, I'm going to kill them all. That's wicked. This is a bloody man. And I'm not getting into the reprobate doctrine tonight, but this man was a reprobate, and he says, and then do answered Doeg the Edomite, which was said over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. But you know what? If you want to feel sorry for yourself, there's always going to be some sodomite to feel sorry for you and to flatter you. I don't know what the word sodomite means. Well, if you go back to the Hebrew, the word sodomite means a faggot. Okay? That's what that word means, in case you didn't know. Sorry, YouTube, you know. You know, assuming that nothing else has triggered their algorithm, who knows, I don't know what this, this sermon might do. But there's always going to be some faggot to feel sorry for you. Oh, yeah, 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 Saul, you are a victim. It, it, was not, it wasn't your fault. It's all these other people's fault. And he's going to be right there. And you know what? That's what's going on today. The Black Lives Matter because, you know, the Black Lives Matter are ran by a bunch of queers, a bunch of LGBT communities. And they're trying, to, why, why would they do that? They're trying to attach themselves to this person who's a victim in their own mind so that they can use them to fulfill their own perverted desires. And the, the, to these days, the fags are trying to attach themselves to the civil rights movement. It's not, even, it's not happening anymore so that they can normalize perversion in this country. That's what's going on. Like they're trying to like, like they're trying to pretend like being a fag is a race. And if you don't like homos, you're like a racist or something. Sorry, being a homo is not a race. It's perversion, and you weren't born that way. Sorry, all the science says that that's not a thing. Born that way, you know, it's my orientation. 
No, no, it's not. You, you chose to reject God. You chose. You chose. Okay? Don't feel sorry for yourself. You know, don't have this chip on your shoulder. Don't just have this cocky attitude. And then the police or officer pulls you over, and you're just, <coughs> and you're dressed like a criminal. And then you get police, you know, brutality. And, it, you know, even if it is, it's like, you know what? You brought it on yourself, you dummy. Why don't you dress like a Christian? And then people won't think you're a criminal. And then why don't you show some just respect and have some tactfulness, even if he is out of line, you're probably going to just save yourself a lot of hurt. This is just called common sense. Welcome, children. You're learning about common sense. You're learning how to avoid problems for yourself by acting like a jackrabbit, right? And jackrabbits are not cool, just in case you don't know what that is. Anyway, so don't, you know, don't dress like a criminal. You know what? Well, I should be able to just dress how I want, and it shouldn't matter. Well, you know, maybe so. But that's not how the world works, though, is it? Because, you know, man looketh on the outward appearance, like the Bible says. You know, if you're putting yourself based on your appearance into certain stereotypes, and then you're mad when someone assumes that that's what you're like, don't be upset. Just try, just don't, just abstain from all appearance of evil. You know, I don't think Brother Carter, if he gets pulled over tonight, is going to have a police officer just, oh, this guy, he's probably some kind of drug addict. He's in a suit and tie. You know what I mean? He's going to, and he's, he's a respectful guy. He's going to be like, yes, sir, you know, well, you know. That's, he's not going to have problems. You know, you know, and if I, as a white person, if I dress like, you know, with, with my pants sagging and I'm just wearing, I look like a hubba, looking like somebody who belongs in Walmart at 2 a.m. or whatever, and I got, a, you know, a mask on my face and I'm just, you know, I got tattoos on my eyes or whatever, and I got this cocky attitude, well, either right or wrong, the police officer is probably going to make some assumptions about me, isn't he? Because I'm white. That's why. He's just a racist. Because I'm white. That's why. What happened to my white privilege? It's not working. It's like, no. No. So use some common sense. Don't be an idiot. Right? You know, and, and here's one last thought. You know, I know I've gone a little while. One last thought here, or, in, you know, one of the last thoughts. I don't know if it's the last thought. So don't hold me to that. You know, if you were legitimately, you know, victimized, right? Because we just talked about people who were a victim, and but they weren't, they're a victim in their own mind. They're not really victims, like Saul. He was, the pro- he was the cause of his own problem. Well, if you actually were a victim and, you know, something bad happened to you, well, you know what? Still don't be a victim in your mind because that's sti- it's still not going to help you. You know what? Why don't you just allow sufferings that happen to you in this life to make you better? make you stronger, and then why don't you just let it go, forget about it, why don't you forgive and forget if someone did you wrong, that's kind of Christian, isn't it, actually, I think that's what the Bible teaches we're supposed to do, I think that, you know, Jesus, when he was on the cross, I don't think he did anything to deserve that, I think he was a victim, right, he, and when you know, when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, He didn't say, oh, they're just doing this because I'm a Jew and they're Romans and they just hate Jews. It's racist. They're all racist, man. No, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that's the attitude we should have. You know, we should love our enemies. If someone hates you and they're treating you badly because you're black or because you're white or whatever you're, whatever the thing, you know, even besides skin tone, right? If they're treating you badly, love your enemies, the Bible says. You know, recompense uh, no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, Romans 12, 19, in case you were wondering where I'm reading, avenge not yourselves. If you were done wrong, someone treated you poorly or wrongfully because of your skin color or for some other reason, just take that in your own hands then because, you know, they shouldn't have done that. You just take it in your own hands and you're justified. No, avenge not yourselves, the Bible says, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. If you're right with God, you have Christian privilege, God's going to be right there to take care of your enemies. Why don't you pray for your enemies? Then you'll heap up more coals on their head, right? That's what the Bible says. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Take the high road, man. You know, it's easy to be a victim. You know, you know I brought up Joseph earlier. He was done wrong. He was the victim. He didn't deserve that. And you know what he didn't do? Complain and sulk and like, oh, why did this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? He's a slave. He actually was a slave. He wasn't just like descended from someone that was maybe, right? He actually was a slave, and he was a young man too. But you know what? He had integrity, and the Bible says that the Lord, you know, prospered him. He was a prosperous man. And that, you know, and, and he had integrity with the word of God, and he didn't commit adultery with the wife of Potiphar, right? You know, and then what happened to him? He was second in command in the whole nation. Think about Daniel. Daniel, very similar. Daniel was just kind of an innocent bystander of his wicked nation that was all going into captivity for all their sin, and he's a slave basically his whole life, right? Or at least starts out that way. And he was a eunuch, which probably means he was castrated, right? That's not fun. That's not cool. But what, what, what did he do? Did he just have the victim attitude and envy? Or, oh, man, must have, been, must have been nice being born when David was the king. Wouldn't have to deal with all this. No. He had an excellent spirit, and God prospered him too. It said that God brought him into favor with the prince of the eunuchs. God brought him into favor, and, and he's a slave? Yeah. And you know what? He didn't stay in this position because he ended up becoming the second in command of the whole nation too. And it wasn't just the nation. I mean, this is an empire. And you know, how did he do it? He didn't do it by being a victim in his own mind. He didn't do it by envying others. He did it by keeping God's law. He did it by having integrity with God's law. He did it by getting Christian privilege. That's what you do. And you know what? Even if people do do you wrong, and they're your enemy, and they're treating you badly, you know what? God, the Bible says uh, in Proverbs, it says in Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. You know what the solution is? Get God on your side. Get, pr get some Christian privilege. How do you do that? Be righteous. It's a choice you can make. Don't be a victim in your own mind. You can, the ball is in your court. Don't just try to blame. Don't be like Saul. If you've sinned, if you've done something wrong, own up to it. Repent from that sin. Get right with God. If you're not saved, of course, get saved. And then be righteous. Have that excellent spirit. And then God will prosper you even if you're in a bad situation. And if you stick with it, you know, the latter end, like with Job, will be more blessed than the beginning. Stick with it. Have integrity. Do what's right. In conclusion to this sermon, don't be a racist. If you're racist, you're wicked. You're not right with God. You need to repent from that now. Why don't you just learn some, some facts? You're ignorant. Don't be prideful. Don't be prideful about what skin color you are or, or whatever. Don't be envious. Don't look at others' it, you know, situation and covet that. Like, oh, it must be nice to have whatever or to be like that. Don't, but don't be envious. You're, you're destroying yourself. That's rottenness in your own bones. Don't be a victim in your own mind, especially when nothing even happened to you. You know, don't listen to people trying to get you to feel sorry for yourself because you're probably just a sodomite or something, that, uh, someone flattering you, right, you know, when you're not a victim. You know, be content, love your enemies, be righteous, uh, be a righteous, saved Christian to get God's blessing and to have Christian privilege. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us the, the keys to have a blessed life no matter how we were born. Thank you for not being a racist. Pray that this sermon was edifying and that people, uh, everyone here received it in, in the spirit that I uh, hopefully was, try was trying to deliver it in, in the, in the spirit of meekness and love. And I pray that you just bless us all. Help us to just know your word for ourselves so we can apply it to our lives and have Christian privilege in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.